All right, Ian, we got uh, we got voicemails, don't we? We do. We you go to anchor.fm slash the CU podcast and you can leave us a comment, a question. You you can flatter us. You can say that I prefer you didn't. Ian's skin is looking glowing today. I absolutely prefer you did not my hair is looking, to flatter me. My hair is looking looking fluttery. Fluttery? Fluttery hair? All right, here's the first one. Hey guys, this is Duffy from Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville. I'm curious as to what your favorite Lucas Arts or Lucas Film game is of all time. Thank you. Did we do this one before? Yeah. This might be the wrong Duffy. Is there, is there more than one Duffy? Yeah, we already did that. I, There's more than one Duffy. I'm sorry, we answered that one before. I randomly said uh, full throttle. So, sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, Duffy number one. This is Duffy number two. Hey, Pat and Ian, this is Duffy from Louisville, Kentucky. Same I'm Duffy. sick of all these softball questions. How oh. old were you when you lost your virginities and describe the experience? Thanks, guys. Wait a second, Duffy. How did you go from <laughs> asking us about <laughs> Lucas Art game to getting trying to get personal? And, probably, and your voice had a different as well uh, there. Unless there's two Duffies in Louisville. Is there two Duffies in Louisville? No, it's the Kentucky? exact same voice. It sounded a little different. No, that you was want, the you exact want to talk about, same. Voice. Do you want to talk about losing your virginity? I absolutely don't. I, 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 it's, I not, it's not embarrassing. It's just none of no, your it's not. I it's just, just, I, I will come out on the record. I find talking about sex to be one of the least fucking interesting things in the world. There's just no reason. It, there's, for it. it's, it, it's absolutely mind-numbingly it, boring because people either do it to brag or to be self-deprecating. It's like fuck off with that. Not fuck off you, Duffy, but Duffy, come on, come on, Duffy. Let's see if you could rebound on the third question in the future. Hey, Pat and Ian, this is CU Podcast Memes from Los Angeles. Oh, hi. And my question is, with all of the schemes that GameStop has come up with over the last couple of years to keep their heads above water, the one that seems the most reasonable from sort of like an outside perspective, having never really worked in that kind of retail my whole life, is the turning half the store into Spencer Gifts with the T-shirts and the pop vinyls. Like, that doesn't seem like a bad idea, but it seems like a lot of people refer to it as a bad or a wasted idea and i was just wondering why that is why is that ian um it tends to show a business in panic that is my main reason desperation a little bit um it's why people get if you've always sold cards at your at your video game shop i'll bring this all around if you've always sold cards at your video game shop that's one thing if you've always brought in certain things but when you see a business that used to be known entirely for selling video games and suddenly they move half the video games out of their store and put t-shirts and pops and toys sure. and other shit that no longer has really anything to do with video games or it's just tangentially related to video games people start to look at that as a desperation move why why did you do that why did you get rid of half of what your store was is there a way that's, to a, it? that's a bad idea is there a way to integrate it slowly that would be more natural I, I, I think there probably is, but I think like, if, like if you sold pops, you would sell pops at your store. Like you, I mean, they would they would move after a while, wouldn't they? But I would never want to sell pops at the store. The only thing I've ever thought about, perhaps the only thing that I've ever think I, I've ever thought mm, kind of makes sense, if you know about it, is like I know some video game stores that sell uh, Pokemon TCG and um, Magic okay. TCG. And the reason why is anyone can buy those boxes. You don't make a lot of money on them, but it's something that people pick up. Oh, you don't? You don't no, make you don't. Wholesale? You make very, very little money on that, then people TCGs. Just, right. What I hear people do with that, they, they'll just buy a ton of the boxes and hold on for four or five years until the price goes up and they'll sell them. Sure, they can do they that do too. That. But uh, the markup is like, honestly, I think it's maybe like if, if, you, if you buy a box of pokemon tcg and sell it at msrp i think you make like 30 dollars off of a 110 dollar box like it's not it's not it's good. something but it's like yeah oh, but okay, that, you, you might make like a buck off at of least that's not a lot of space you can put on the counter right you know? so that's something that people could do I, i'm sure there is a way to integrate it but I, i'm just saying even, even if you are doing it for all the right reasons and you just want to offer more stuff and your business isn't in danger that sort of sudden shift is going to make people question Whoa! What, what's with this overnight change? Have you seen that in one of the stores you used to like frequent that they, all of a sudden they change their stock into something? Like no, that? not really. I just I I've heard of that happening. Yeah, with game stores, but like game pretty, stores do it. I I've never known one person pre-pandemic again. Pre-pandemic, lots of game stores have done what GameStop has done to try to increase sales. Pre-pandemic, obviously, there's a shot in the arm for retro game stores. Whoever that got through the pandemic, with hopefully with PPP and other stuff, that they 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 had to shift. I knew a couple of stores that yeah, we had to sell other stuff. We yeah. had to diversify because retro games was not enough right. to stay in business. 
All right, uh, next. Hey, Pat and Ian. This is Pat from Boston again. This question's for Pat. Huh? As you've been playing through the N64 games for your certain guidebook, are there any titles that you assumed were going to be garbage, but it turns out they're shockingly good or surprisingly fun without giving away stars? Thanks. Oh, now i got to open up the N64 uh uh, spreadsheet worksheet that me and the two editors use. You don't know off the top of your head if a game surprised well, you? No, no, yeah. The one did, but I want to find ones that I, I edited because I only, I've only played so far about 20 and reviewed about 20. Oh, I thought he was talking about the ones you've played. Yeah, I've only, I've only done 20 for the book right. so far, but I've edited a lot more than that. Okay. I've edited about 60 to 80 for the book, so I, I want to I look for ones. So for the ones that I did specifically, uh, Sid and Punishment was really good, but I heard that was a good game. But that that exceeded, yes. that exceeded my expectations. It's a good game. And it's English friendly. They did the they did the voices of the characters in English. I don't know why, but maybe they figured it was going to come out in the U.S. But but I'm surprised it didn't come out in the U.S. So Sin and Punishment was better than I thought. Very challenging. Very cool game. Lots of cool uh, you know like rail shooting stuff. besides the you know the movement stuff, it's a rail shooter. Um, so that one was good. Um, let's see on my list here that I wasn't surprised. Center court tennis was, in a, was a delight by Hudson Soft tennis game. It was a delight. Virtual chess 64. I'm very picky when it comes to my chess simulators because obviously I have a little bit of a chess background, not a big one. Virtual chess 64 did a great job. Uh, don't play the shitty 3D fucking version because it, you, can, you can shut them off though. Where it's battle chess is awful. But there's so many good tutorials in virtual chess. You probably could be a novice and start from nothing and learn from that game. There's a lot of cool tutorials on that. Yeah, uh, on that one. You telling me about surprised. that sounded cool, like how you uh, could do multiple iterations of boards, so yeah, you, you could kind of branch off. You can play different boards, or yeah. or four different players could play four different games at the same time. So that was a good one. And then uh, Paperboy was. I only give it three stars. There's a giveaway, but Paperboy I enjoyed uh, more than I thought I would. I thought it'd be total trash, but no, there was some enjoyment to Paperboy. It was clever. It was. It was. It, it got the tone of Paperboy right. Um, so it, as much as you can say that it was referential to the original arcade game, uh, the Paperboy 64, even in 3D, that surprised me. Um, then the biggest one was Asteroids Hyper 64. That really impressed me how well that they, they really wrung as much as I could out of a single screen Asteroids game with that. That was really impressive to me. You love Asteroids. Though. Yeah, but like you figure, oh, it's just a cash. And no, they really, with the power ups and the bosses, like they did as much as they could. With that, there was some there's like there's some strategy involved in some of those stages. Again, single screen. So, there. all right, thanks for that uh, question there. And what is the next one on my list? Hi, Ian and Pat. Uh, this is Christine from Staten Island. Staten I want Island. To thank you guys for the great podcast you do. You're welcome. So, my question is about some recommendations on video games. Okay. Um, I have very slow reflexes, and so, so I find it. a lot of retro games just really impossibly difficult. I uh, get Frank's excitement in the old uh, punk video where he beat the Mario. I have a lot of trouble with Super Mario Brothers, too. Um, so, for people like me uh, with you know, dexterity or manual speed impairments, can you really suggest any retro games that might work, you know, that might be fun other than RPGs? Um, any techniques or tricks? Mm. Before I get into that, I want, you to, I want you all to recognize this and how I battled for your people online who, when I called it Mario. People from the East Coast that actually knew people that named themselves Mario called it Mario because no one from New York and New Jersey that was named Mario called themselves Mario that I knew. It was always Mario. That's just a thing. What, what, they want to maybe... Uh, Englishize the word or Americanize the word, but that's just how it worked for Mario's. Sorry, go on. Um, so I was going to say roguelikes, but uh, she asked no RPGs, which is, makes sense because RPGs would generally be the easy the easy answer. Um, so this one still requires some dexterity, but I would, uh, but but not as much. Um, it re it requires more. Uh, requires more foresight than anything more more planning ahead um try the low low games okay yeah try the low low games there's, there's, the, some, that, there's that, a little that, twitchiness right a little there's bit. a little twitchiness to them but it, it's still more like it's not like ninja gaiden 
you have to figure stuff out, but you have to plan ahead. And if you plan ahead, it gets less and less twitchy. Um, so I think the Lolo games, something like Lolo, something like Kickle Cubicle, where there's action involved, but a slower paced play style is just kind of the name of the game. Yeah, it's been three months since we mentioned Kickle Cubicle, so we were overdue to mention Kickle Cubicle. I will always mention it. It's a great game. A cute little ice ice boy. Um, I'm going to go a little bit different since I don't think you, you had to just be consoles based. Uh, how about turn-based strategy games? You get to think. You don't. You don't. You know what I mean. You could. Um, you don't need reflexes at all. You just gotta click. Okay, build my uh, granary now. Even build some real-time game. strategy games would probably be. I would think would be okay. It depends on what kind of reflexes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Especially early ones. I mean, Warcraft. Warcraft. You don't need to be really twitchy. You have to be fast, but you have. You, yeah. You got You got to cue the stuff up in your head. Yeah. You don't have to be twitchy. You don't have to be too specific, pixel perfect. You right, just click exactly. on. Click on your unit. Click your orc. Click on your, your peon to, to yeah no, that's true no any strategy game then for the most part yeah I think any strategy game you're not gonna live work. or die on the twitchiness of that like a first person shooter you would right. maybe at high high levels but yeah we're not comp- we're not Star- we're not doing that. we're not doing Starcraft right. in, in Korea in a, in a stadium uh okay what's the next one here hey guys it's Jacob from AZ again gonna head straight into the question a while ago Matt McMuscles admitted during his video playing Castlevania Resurrection that he was in talks with other content creators including Norm the gaming historian to potentially buy the demo disc when it went on eBay before it was taken down and eventually dumped by the owner as far as we know the point I'm getting here is when a prototype or demo becomes available for an astronomical amount and it hasn't been dumped yet Will there come a time when content creators do come together and buy it from greedy sellers and collectors? I mean, it'd be a better use of our time than inflating the prices of trading cards of pocket monsters. I mean, come on. Why don't we do something for the good of gaming preservation? Thank you for the airtime. Come on. Really really professional uh, question and and, and great cadence there, Jacob. Yes, good stuff. Um, I I think that we may get to that point, but we already have people doing that, and they're the preservationists. Anytime something like this happens, I guarantee you a bunch of phone calls are made to us. I can think of a few people who are probably almost always CC'd in any conversation like this, where people are getting together and pooling their money to uh, buy stuff to preserve it. And it's been we we've I I can't think of anything in specific, but we've actually talked about uh, specific examples of this happening before, where people will pool money together, you know, so some. Well, can win an auction in Japan. Well, well, well we see it. We saw it in person at PRG with Steve in the, in the Sim City. Well, the Sim City, yeah, the Sim City I, thing I, happened. I offered, that was in real time. I offered to put in money to help. I, I don't have the, t- the the pockets that Steve has, deep pockets, but I offered to put in money to help because there was a risk that both of those. Both, remember, remember that seller had two of them, and both yes. were potentially going to be sold off to one one asshole was going to lock them away forever. So we at least got one dumped. Thank God, uh, there. So, um, no, it's happened. Like, yeah, it's, 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 here's the thing. Now that it's more out in the open, this isn't like five, six years ago where, where people didn't care as much about preservation. There wasn't all these stories happening every other week. Now it's more and more in, in people's, uh, you know, field of vision that you, I think you have, you could pull resources more easily between influencers and collectors. But like, you could. Yeah, I think you're going to start to find... Um... But you don't negotiate with terrorists. And, that's, and that less and less of these big sales are, are happening, though, because of that. Was it the backlash of this Castlevania thing? It was a huge backlash. Yeah, there was for that. You're right. Hey, Pat and Ian. Uh, Brent from Whippany, New Jersey. Whippany! Uh, Patrick, is it an 80s ass if you see vintage 80s jeans such as Jordash or Sergio Valente on a present day ass? I was driving and I said, oh, 80s ass. And my wife mm-hmm. wasn't so sure. So what's your take? <laughs> Are you good? Okay, thanks. Okay, so I am the 80s ass expert since we, we look at them at the, at, on the Twitches the Twitch uh, streams, mm-hmm. we have the 80s ass uh, emoji. And it's equal opportunity. It's, it's men and women. Let's make, make that clear. And no, and this is why. The 80s ass isn't just what you're wearing. It's the whole feel of the 80s. And it's also, unfortunately, you know, in the 80s, uh, there was not as much curvature in the 80s. So that all goes into the 80s ass there. I, I, but, but thank you, Brett. That's a very important question you asked. Twitch.tv slash country code for more 80s asses every Wednesday. Uh, there. Thank you so much. Any, any, you have any thoughts on the 80s ass, Ian? None. In particular, we talked about the, like, the Jordash commercials were ridiculous. The early 80s, Jordash! You know, like the, like the, 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 we're still in the early 80s, like 81. We're still like in the disco, how everything's shot and it looks terrible and sparkling lights and seeing everything all the is 80- sparkly and fuzzy. And- yes. Yeah. And that's where the 80s ass thing came from because you had uh, all, all, all the Jordash uh, jeans stuff and asses flashing in your face. So that's where, that's where it came from. 
Uh, and of course, then you went by the late eighties. You have the awful fucking Levi commercials where they're trying to be too fucking cool, and it's in black and white on the yeah. street. And um, those were are awful. But the early eighties. Uh, plus, there was a lot of like, yeah, there was a lot of like um, the one-off designer uh, jeans stuff in the early eighties. You didn't realize how many there were. Like, holy shit, there were a lot of these. Like trying to get it must have been like a big craze in the early eighties for like designer import jeans. Then we we're too young to to realize. I think it was the first time jeans really became designer. You think so? Yeah. Early 80s, like late 70s, early 80s? Hey, Pat and Ian, this is Jason from Texas. Let's have a couple quick questions for you both. Do you think Microsoft will ever come out with their own version of a Xbox Mini Classic system, just like the Super Nintendo, uh, Nintendo, and PS1 uh, Classic Mini? Do you think so, Ian? Uh, no. Not in their best interest. No, yeah, I don't think so. Um, especially because they don't really need to. Their whole focus has been backwards compatibility. Anything yeah. that they would put on that mini system is probably something that they'd just be like, hey, we can make it backwards compatible and you can pay us for it again. Yeah, or we'll just remaster it and we'll put it in a set and it's sixty bucks. Yeah, they're not you know. they're not an old they're they're not like an old video game company with like a deep history to pull sure. from. They 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 I, I know that they're fucking twenty one years or twenty years old now, but it's 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 different it's yeah they have a different philosophy they're not nintendo you know they're they're not like that was there a second part to this which should be kind of cool if they did and second question is what did you both think of the new the e3 announcement of microsoft unveiling their xbox mini refrigerator system i think it was, the mini fridge was cool i just cool they're doing that they obviously partnered with someone to it was help a neat weird stupid it's, it's, thing it's yeah. cool hey pat hey Ian. this is josh long time listener long time caller so about maybe two podcasts ago, you guys were talking about that Action Park um, documentary on HBO. And I just watched like it, six, and it's seven. pretty fascinating. It's kind of fucked up what went on at the park. But I was just wondering if you guys could maybe every show kind of talk about some kind of movie that you saw over the weekend or any kind of TV show. That'd be awesome. Thanks. It would be. We should do that. Well, we've point. discussed it. But, and we'll we get should, there. I, I wanted to talk about Loki, but Ian didn't watch it. Um, but that's okay. I'm not saying you had to. It's also five hours of your time to watch Loki. So it's like, it's, yeah. I understand it. But, this would have been it would have been harder, <laughs> this, especially this week. But no, we should pick a, like you know at least like if we if we had done it and, like this is how we would do it. We would pick a show like Loki and we'd have to watch one episode every week and talk about it. Yes, that makes sense. Had we had done that for Loki, but Loki is a giant setup show. That's not any spoilers, and that's what annoyed me at the end of it. That's what annoyed me. Yeah, you weren't happy with that. Falcon Winter Soldier. Wasn't a setup show. There, it sets up a, like a teeny bit, but it there's it's a story. It's a self-contained story. It's its own thing. It's its own thing. Um, and then the what was the first one, uh, Wandavision. Um, there, it's a setup in a little bit, but it's it's its own story. So like, yeah, the, the Winter Soldier and Falcon one, I liked the best because of that. It wasn't just setup. Plus, it wasn't also padded out like two extra episodes, like like uh, Wandavision was padded out. And um, uh, Loki, I don't think, was padded out. I just think they didn't know what to do with the idea after, like, three episodes, I'll just say. They just sort of ran out of ideas and said, oh, we got to do six episodes at least. <laughs> and it probably could have been, like, four. Or, you know, there was some padding. But it, it, it was still fun. Uh, we'll do a couple more here. Hey there, it's a quick man from the UK. My question okay. is, um, are there any rhythm games, either past or present, that you've gotten into or are getting into? Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. The Quick Man from Capcom. Thanks for, for <laughs> calling. Uh, I love rhythm games. Never been particularly great at any of them, but among ones that I have done time with, uh, I used to. We used to go to Canada to play DDR in Buffalo. Really? Yeah. They before one? before DDR machines were everywhere. So this would have been like third mix. So we're talking like the early days of DDR still. Um, we used to drive up to Clifton Hill in Canada, which was like a big touristy area that had a big arcade. And we'd play um, DDR. I used to play Pump It Up. Um, I have uh, played a, a decent amount of Beat Mania 2DX. That is probably the rhythm game I am the worst at. And I love it. Um, I even took apart a couple of the PS2 controllers and modded them. Um, I've built my own modified dance pads. Um, and then in terms of like modern uh, rhythm games, I really like the uh, I really like Taiko no, no Tatsujin, the um, the Taiko Drum Master game. And uh, um, Voez on the Switch is one of my favorite rhythm games. Uh, it's fantastic. 
Um, so, oh, and I'm really, really big into all the Hatsune Miku rhythm games. I, I play a shitload of rhythm games. I just don't talk about it because I'm really bad at them. I enjoy oh. sitting in my chair, hitting the buttons, bouncing around to stupid music that I enjoy. Um, but I've never been, I, I, I've never gotten good enough at them to, to talk about them. So I, I don't. But yes, I am oftentimes playing rhythm games. I always forget that this was a Nintendo game, Elite Beat Agents. Yeah, Elite Beat Agents is fun. I'm, I, I, we, that's one we always miss out when we talk about properties Nintendo can probably bring back if they wanted to try. Um, it's funny because it was a different game in Japan, and I think they have they they, okay. they they've never brought them back. They've they they have put them references to them in like Smash. They have and stuff like that, yeah. But Elite Beat Agents, I played it. Um, I played through. I think most of it. It gets tough. It gets tough. Um, but. There was such a nice energy to Elite Beat Agents, not just great. I'm looking at the song selection. I forgot how many great songs are on here. Like you're talking about Chicago, David Bowie, Rolling Stones, Hoobastank on here, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Queens on here. See, I love the Avril game, Levine's but I thought I thought the 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 song selection was its weakest point. No, I, it's a it's a it's a nice sort of like soiree of uh, of different soiree. classics. Anything with Queen, come on. You know, it's, it's uh, I was born to love you, which isn't like one of the. It's, it's like that's like a, that's like a B side Queen song, but still. So I remember, I remember the game being that you have these little vignettes, little story vignettes. Yeah, and some are pretty touching, if I remember. Some are like they're very cute. Some are like kind of touching about like one was like the memory of like her her dead father or whatever. Or I think there was something like our dead mother or something. I'm like, there's some. This is like some thought put into this. This isn't just okay. We're just doing like you know just dancing. We're just dancing around. There's like there's a storyline here, and I'm surprised that they never thought about bringing doing another one of those. Like that could be a Switch game. I wanted to do it mm -hmm. and the, you know so that's the one that's the one the main one i remember playing uh, is that one i don't like ddr because i just never got into it i'm not quarry enough or you're not really dancing i don't know but i do, I do like just dance though that's not really rhythm that's actually just dancing i wouldn't call that rhythm. well i mean you still have to hit certain spots in time to the music so it's rhythm it's just a different type of rhythm game but, but you're still doing stuff in turn in time yeah, to the music. okay all right i, I enjoy just dance on, on the wii I enjoyed it. I remember playing at E3, the, or whatever, the PlayStation one, because it actually was more, it did both both like limbs and everything and legs with the VR stuff. Not VR, but the fucking sensor thing that they had at the time. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And recently I've been playing Beat Saber. Yeah. Beat Saber? I play, when, I come, when it comes down to it, I play a shitload of rhythm games. <laughs> it's like one of oh. my most played genres, but I just don't ever talk about it because I'm not good at them. All right. We got, uh, we got one more here. I think we have a friend uh, that called in. Oh, hi there. This is your friend Tommy calling. Just wanted to thank you guys personally for all the death threats I've been getting, because that's <laughs> always nice. Yeah, and keep acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. As I walk out to my mailbox, and there's a threatening letter sitting in there, and it's got one of those stupid RBI baseball stickers <laughs> on it. I guess this is just a big joke to you guys, but I was actually fearing for my life at a Crayola Funhouse! <laughs> I'm probably the first person in history to ever say that. Any minute I'm thinking somebody's going to sneak up behind me with one of those colored pencils and boom, right in the <laughs> neck. That's how I would do it if I was going to kill me. But of course, I would never go through with something like that. But I think I know who would. Somebody who's been playing too much Nintendo Switch! <laughs> <laughs> that's right you know what tommy I, you know what we, we take for granted how much the switch has perverted us and making us more violent I, yes you know I, I i you know i agree about that if you're in the games with with blood and violence and sexual content and and kids in sexual compromising positions and rape uh on the nintendo if if, if, if that's what you want then buy a switch yeah we forget about that tommy well i apologize there <laughs> 